morning. I am not Vonnie because she is at an RV park with Joe, and hopefully they haven't killed each other yet. But uh, no, the, seriously, they're having a great time. They're over in Auburndale at a, at a campground doing some RVing. So because I am not Vonnie, I'm going to do announcements the way I do announcements, which is just this is how I do them, okay? I'm not as fancy as she is. So here we go. Oh, you know, I have to be able to read. If you can't read, you can't do announcements. Hold on. There you go. Old age. Uh, man night is tomorrow night, um, and we, uh, we will have food. Marcos is supposed to be bringing food for us uh, tomorrow night. December 16th is the church Christmas party. We will be in this room at the back. Bring finger food, and that should be a really nice night. It starts at 6 p.m. December 17th, that's next Sunday after church, we're doing a ride. We're leaving from here around 1130-ish, because I know we have to lock everything up and get people rolling, but we're going to go over to the joinery in Lakeland. Think about it like a mall food court without the mall and better food. That, that's how you want to think about the joinery, all right? So really, really good food. Um, there's a lot of different options there. There's open air seating inside. It's like a big warehouse. So when we get over there, we can just eat, eat whatever you want to eat. I know I'm going to eat the Japanese stuff because there's like some really cool Sabu ramen place that just rocks. But there's burritos, there's burgers, there's barbecue. There, I'm forgetting some stuff. And there's even like a homemade ice cream place, which has like a coffee and donut ice cream, which is to die for. Anyway, okay. And I will be having some of that next week. Okay. Uh, couples Bible studies on the 18th. Celebrate Recovery Christmas Party is on the 19th at 6 p.m. And they're going to be out by the fire pit. Lucky them. So they're going to be having a great time out there. And I'm going to have definitely join them for that. On Christmas Eve, we will still have our two services in the morning on Christmas Eve, which is on that Sunday. We'll, we will have our regular two services in the morning. But then that night at 6 p.m., we will have a Christmas Eve service. If you've never been to our Christmas Eve service, it's not super long. It's more of a family kind of a thing. We will do some really cool Christmas carols, some Christmas songs. The worship team's got some cool stuff planned for us. We do Silent Night. We do the Christmas story. We light some candles. Then we sing Happy Birthday to Jesus, and we have this really cool birthday cake for Jesus that we get to eat on, which is fantastic. My wife makes that every year, and it's fantastic. Okay. Card ministry is going to meet on December 30th at 10 a.m. <clears throat> to noon. And then uh, we do uh, have a New Year's game night. Those of you who like to play games... We'll, there will be people here on campus New Year's Eve, and we will be out here just playing cards or playing games or just being goofy and staying out of trouble. That's the main thing, right? Um, the, on the first is High Noon Ride. We will be going over to the High Noon Ride this year. Um, it's, it's, on, it's on a Monday, and we will be, and everybody should have it off unless you don't, I apologize, but we will be leaving here sometime in the morning and heading over there. The ride leaves at noon, but there's a, there is a, like a donation that's required to, to actually get the food, but it's not don't have to. I think it's just suggested, but I think it's $10 a person. But they also do drawings there. There's a big, it's a cool event. Make sure that you go to that. On the 5th and the 6th, we're going to have this really cool, our brother cowboy right here, Charlie, is going to be, uh, has put together an awesome tent revival that's going to be going on here on property. When he came to me and said, can I set up a tent on the property and do a revival? I was like, sure. So we're doing it. And uh, so he's been working hard on it. So we're going to put it out here in the parking lot. They're going to have uh, people doing their testimonies, have some really cool music. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be at 6 to 8 on the 5th. And then it starts at 1 p.m. on the 6th. And they'll be asking people just to come to church for the 7th. So if you guys are available and would like to participate, man, come hang out and, uh, and, and chip in and just have a good time with it. It's going to be a blast. I, unfortunately, will be out of town, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, because I'll be celebrating my 31st wedding anniversary with my lovely bride. So we will be on a cruise. We will be on a cruise that weekend, but I will be here in spirit because I think it's an awesome thing that, that, that's going to be going on, and I, and I just love it. So on that note, I'm going to get out of the way because I, I don't like doing announcements. Okay. Go for it, guys. You can tell how much I love them.
those of you who've already heard me say this this morning, sorry. <laughs> so if you're here for first and second service, just plug your ears. Um, now I was telling first service this morning that I just love Christmas. It's uh, one of my favorite times of the year. Um, and there's just so much, everyone's a li- like just seems a little bit happier this time of year, you know? And uh, I was telling them like, it's not when you grow up and you like you're not a kid anymore it it can tend to be like a little bit not as exciting for obvious reasons you know because who doesn't like gifts right if you don't like gifts you're fibbing but uh (laughs) but thankfully as christians um we have something else to be incredibly thankful for and that is for the coming of jesus to be born in a lowly stable so that we so that we could have eternal life because that was the beginning of his walk on earth and so in that night the whole world rejoiced there was wise men and shepherds that came from all over the globe to see Jesus and they just worshipped him because they knew they were in the presence of an almighty king. And so this morning, as we are getting ready for Christmas and we're preparing, and there's all this hustle and bustle around um, family get-togethers and shopping, let's not forget the reason we as Christians celebrate Christmas, and that is Jesus. And so let's worship him this morning. Let's sing about how incredible and how great and how good he is, because he is. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice.
been lots of times that I'm just, I'm broken and I'm, I'm hurting and I just feel, you know, I just feel like everything is just bad, you know, because even though, even though we're Christians, you know, Jesus never said that it would be easy, right? It certainly wasn't for him. And so, if you're hurting this morning, if you're broken, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're sad, if you're heartbroken, if you're anxious, I want you to just come to Jesus this morning. I want you to lay down whatever it is that you are carrying that is weighing heavy on you. I just want you to give it to Jesus. If it's family, friends, your own anxiety or stress, give it to Jesus. Are you hurting and broken?
the crowd Tell the world of the treasure you found Tell the world of the treasure you And have a seat as we come into a time of prayer. Man, what an awesome time of worship. And now we want to just come into a time of prayer with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let's just take a moment and reflect on how good God is and how he continues to just bless us in so many ways and just worship him right where you're at this morning. Head bowed, eyes closed. Just tell him how good he is in your own heart this morning. Hmm. Wow, God, you're awesome. Now take a moment and just reflect on where your situation is this morning and how you're doing. Have a moment of introspection and ask yourself how you're really doing with your relationship with God this morning. And maybe you realize that there's some situations that you need to speak to him about. Maybe there's some things you need to bring to him. Ask him to forgive you or to help you or to restore you or just to be with you. You do that right now. Have those moments and talk to the Lord. We need you, Jesus. God continues to bless and provide for us in so many awesome ways, and we don't want to miss an opportunity to say thank you to him. So together, let's just all say, thank you, Jesus, this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, and he is so good. And we want, to, we want to lift up prayer requests, and this morning we're going to be lifting up a church as we do every week. We pray for a different church, and this week it's Ecclesia Revived. It's a new church plant here in Plant City. We want to pray for them, that the Lord would bless them and guide them and help them to grow. And we want to continue to also pray for all of our men and women in the military, that the Lord will surround them with angels, protect them, and be with them and bring them home safely. And we really need to pray for our country. So we need to pray for America. So we want to make sure we remember that. And Scripture told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we're also going to be praying for Israel and that whole situation going on over there and pray for those hostages to be released and so many other things going on. And we want to lift those up. But we want to lift up your prayer request as well. So as you reflect on who we need to pray for this morning and just think about it for a moment, just Let's just speak those names out loud together. Let's just, let's just speak those names. Minnie, Teresa, Felicia, Squeezer, Bass, the boys, Tom. Hmm. Now let's just uh, pray together. Lord God, we come into this place to worship you and to acknowledge that you are the one true God. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the one that we came to worship. <laughs> You are the one that loved us first and sent your son to die for us on the cross. So, Lord, we are in awe of you. And, Lord, we are broken before you, asking you to heal us and to protect us and to forgive us and to be with us in any area of our life that we need you right now. And to help us in our time of need so that we can be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. And, Lord, you've heard us say thank you because we know that you take care of us. We know that you never leave us and you never forsake us. We know that you provide for us miraculously over and over again. And so we want to acknowledge that with gratitude, saying thank you, Jesus, this morning. And, Lord, we've also lifted up all these prayer requests. Lord, you've heard we're lifting up Ecclesia Revived this morning. We ask that you would bless that church and help them to grow and be with those men and women of the military. Lord, they need your protection this morning and bring them home safely to their families. And, Lord, our, our country, we need revival. We need help in so many areas. Lord, I pray that you break the hearts of the believers and help us to find you and to reach out to you and to ask you to help us because our country needs you. And be with Israel and everything going on over there. Lord, please help those, those folks to be released if they're still being held and just be with both those countries over there that you would bring peace and that you would protect Israel and all that's going on. And Lord, we do pray for all the requests that we've just said. Lord, I pray that you'd be with all those who are dealing with medical issues and transplants and disease and, and struggling with maybe pneumonia or different situations. Lord, we just bring them all before you, and we ask that you heal them in Jesus' name, if it be your will, and be with them and guide them and help them to get back to full strength. And Lord, there's so many other issues going on, financial issues. People need you to help them in their finances, their jobs. There's relationship issues. There's people that are just struggling this morning with depression. And with other, other items that we've just lifted up, Lord, we pray that you'd be with each request, each person specially this morning. They'd sense your presence, that they'd know that you're with them, and that you would give them the help that they need this morning. We love you. We thank you. Be present in this place. Lord, there's been a lot of craziness going on around here this morning, a lot of things just uh, happening out of sorts. But here's what we know. Nobody's going to steal our joy. We put our faith in you, so let the enemy be gone and let your spirit dwell richly here in this place. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
you know, we, we've, uh, it's really funny, I'll just tell you briefly, we've had some doors that we can't get open and some other stuff going all morning. It's just been funny how things have happened. And uh, I just keep saying, I'm good, man. The enemy does not win. So uh, I've read the end of the book. He's a loser. Have fun with that. All right. So you, you might think you want a little victory here and there. I, I can't wait to see you getting thrown in the lake of fire. So anyway, on that note, we're going to be taking a look at Scripture this morning, and I'll tell you that we're going to be in the book of Luke still for two more weeks, this week and next week. After that, I'm going to take a break from the book of Luke. Now, I don't do topical sermons. I'm sorry, guys, I just don't do that. So topical sermons a lot of times is when you just say you're going to preach on a topic and you just dump a bunch of verses on people. I just can't do that. It's not the way I was taught to preach. It's not the way God's called me to preach, more importantly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two more weeks out of the book of Luke, and then we're going to do a series, just two sermons, um, of the two sermons up to Christmas, out of John chapter 1, really revealing some of the truths of God coming to earth to save us. And we're going to really dig deeply into the well of the truth of God's Word. I hope that you'll be here for those two sermons. They'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I will not be here the week after that um, because I will be on that cruise, as I've already told you. But Sean is going to be preaching that Sunday. I would ask that you be present here and that you support Sean and, uh, and be here for him as he gets up here and uh, has, to, has to fill these shoes. By the way, they're size 13, Sean. I see you back there. They're size 13 shoes. So, no, there ain't no way. Okay. It's a, it's a joke. He'll do great. God is going to work through him. I know him. He's got a great heart, and the Lord's already working on a great message. And um, I can't wait to hear it, and I'll be listening to it as well, just not from here, from a cruise ship somewhere with way too much food on a plate somewhere. Uh, but uh, we're going to take a look at Luke chapter uh, 17 today, verses 1 through 10, a sermon that I've entitled, Four Important Teachings. And before I read it, i got to tell you, sometimes Jesus does like an information dump on us. He just hits us with a bunch of truths in a row, and you, and you get all this information, and you're like, what am I looking at? And so this is one of those passages I think it's very important for us to grasp and to get and to understand as believers. And so I want to read this to you, and then we're going to break it down. There are four important things, four important teachings that Jesus has for us this morning. I hope you walk away understanding them. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 17, God's word says this, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. And if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. So even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back and repent, you must, you must forgive them. The apostle said, uh, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and then wait on me as while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Um, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do so, um, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Well, there's a lot going on here. Uh, we're going to take a look and see what we have. I like the fact I'm messing with you guys. I didn't put the actual points up there. I just put one, two, three, four. So that way you could pay attention. And I'll tell you what each point is as we get to it. So the first point that we're going to be looking at is a warning. It is a warning about causing others to stumble. Verses one and two, and actually just the very beginning of three, is a warning to, uh, to us and to disciples to not cause others to stumble. So why would I say that? Because he's speaking to the disciples. Verse 1 tells us that he's preaching to the disciples, that he's teaching to the disciples. And we know that the disciples are the true believers. They're the women, the 12, and everybody else, John, Mark, and all the other uh, groups of people that are now following Jesus, believing in him, and trying to learn everything that they can learn. So he's talking to believers, to people who are following him, disciples like us who are following Jesus and trying to be what God has called us to be. And he says, hey, listen, these things are going to happen. These occurrences are going to happen. And what's he talking about? He's talking about th these things that cause people to stumble. These stumbling blocks are going to occur. But woe to you if they come through you. Don't let those things come through you. <coughs> well, I started looking at this word, and the word here in the Greek is scandala. And the actual definition of the word is a trap, a snare, or something that causes you to fall down. It catches you. It keeps you from moving forward. 
And when you think about that, what's going on is that those kind of things are going to happen in a believer's life, right? We're going to have moments in our life where we get caught, trapped, or we fall down, and we get caught up in things we shouldn't be caught up in. That's just reality. We're human beings. We're still made of the flesh. The spirit is in our hearts. The flesh and the spirit battle in our lives until we see Jesus. But what we see going on here is he's saying that these stumbling blocks, these occurrences, they happen naturally. It's going to happen. We will run into situations where we will fall into things that we shouldn't fall into. But woe be it from us to be the ones who cause someone else to stumble. Wow. Man, that's a shocking thing. And, and the more I read different, uh, different arguments and teachers and preachers around this passage, they like to focus on the big things, right? They'll say that when you're talking about being a stumbling block, what you're talking about is like the big teachers and the preachers and the, the, the false prophets that are out there in the world. And those people are out there. I, I've told you guys this story before, but um, I was in Tallahassee. I got invited to go to a revival in Tallahassee, and it was in the, uh, the big basketball stadium at the time there in Tallahassee. And, we, and with the guy who brought me, it's a big luxury box, and he had us all sitting in this little luxury box. And the guy got up to preach, and he immediately quoted a verse, and he misquoted the verse. And he said that if you were not rich, you were not in God's will. Now, I just want you to know, I'm quiet and shy, so you guys all know that about me. So I immediately said out loud in the box, well, that's not what that verse says. That Greek word actually means this. He just totally mistranslated that word. I don't know where he's going with this, but that's a false teaching. And I can't stand for that. So somebody in the box said, well, what do you mean by that? And I explained it. I said, actually, there's plenty of instances in Scripture where people are poor and they're within God's will. If you doubt me, I said, go to Hebrews 11, which is the, cha is the hall of faith, and go to the end where there's people who don't even have clothes to wear and, and places to sleep. And it says that they are people of faith who are going to be blessed by God. So that, what he just said is an absolute bold-faced lie from the Scripture. I can't stand for it. I got escorted out by security. So... Um, it was okay because I still said what, was what the scripture actually said, and I understood what was going on, but I need you to get what he's saying here, that we cannot be the people who make people stumble. And so we want to focus on the big people, right? The big scheme, the preachers and the teachers. I will tell you that that gentleman that we went to go see, he had a major issue just several years later, and there was a book that was written about his false teachings, and he lost a lot of his followers. So that's not to vindicate me because it's not about me being right. God was right. I learned a long time ago in arguments, I'm not right. There's only one person that's right, God. I'm not trying to prove myself right because I know I'm wrong. Every morning when I wake up, my wife reminds me I'm wrong. But anyway, okay. <laughs> that was a joke. Okay, so here we go. So I want you to see he's talking about don't be a stumbling block, but I want you to take it down to a more practical level, right? Can we be a stumbling block to other people? Yeah. I mean, we could do it in a, in, a, in a simple way, like, you know, if, what if you knew somebody was an alcoholic, they came over to your house and you offered them a beer? You're being a stumbling block to that person. That's not right. You should know that this person is struggling with that issue. You should be offering him some ginger ale. You know what I'm saying? You should have an option for him. But I think it's more than that. I think sometimes we draw people into our situation and we cause people to stumble in that. You know that old phrase, misery loves company? You know, sometimes we're struggling with an issue, whatever it is, a sin or something going on in our lives, and we do that sin around other people and we get people to participate. You know, I was talking to one guy and he was saying that he struggles with his language. And I know some of you are like, oh, language doesn't matter. We can say whatever we want to say. Actually, scripturally, it tells us we should watch our language and what we say. So this person was trying to deal with that, was trying to be better about it. But the people that he hung around with were constantly using foul language, and it was leading him to use foul language again. They were being a stumbling block to him. But that can be in a lot of other areas of our life, right? We can be drawn into doing something we're trying not to do because God's working on our hearts because of the actions of someone else. Listen to me really, really closely. Don't be the person who is making other people or helping other people fall into old traps or into new traps. Be the person who comes along other people to encourage them, to help them get past the traps, to pray for them, and to help them do what God has for them. Because it literally says, if you're the one that's doing that, you might as well put a millstone around your neck and throw yourself at the bottom of the water. That's pretty harsh. He's basically saying, you need to understand how serious this is. Do not cause these little ones to stumble because of your actions. And he even goes on at the very beginning of verse 3, and he says, so watch yourselves. We need to watch our actions. 
We need to watch what we say, how we act around other people, because we don't want to be the one that's helping them fall. We want to be the ones that's helping them up. Are you with me? That's what we're called to be. So we have to be very, very aware of that. I want you to see the second thing, point two. That is a warning about unforgiveness. A warning about unforgiveness. Now, this passage begins with the same pattern as Matthew 18. Those of you who are aware of Matthew 18, it's where he's talking about the fact someone has sinned against him very similarly, and he says this is your process that you go through. It's what we call the, the process of church discipline. But I want you to see a couple of things and really grasp what he says here. If a brother or a sister sins against you, verse 3, he says, rebuke them. But there's a couple of factors that we need to make sure that we quantify, that we qualify in this verse. He said, if someone sins against you. Why is that important? Because we need to know, was there actually an offense? Or is this just rumor? Or is this just paranoia? Or is this just made up by somebody else? Because I've been a part of these conversations. I was a part of helping someone deal with an issue one time. They got a phone call from someone, and they asked me to be a mediator in the conversation. Someone called them up and said, I'm invoking Matthew 18. Well, hey, first of all, good. That's what we should all do. We should all invoke Matthew 18. We should all invoke this passage and do what Scripture tells us to do. So they were coming to this person to deal with this issue. But they said, you did this. Small problem. The person wasn't the one that did it. Started this whole issue, ranted, raved, told them how horrible they were that were doing it. And that's not the process either. We're going to talk about the process here in just a minute. But the, that's not the process. But they attacked this person only to find out the person didn't even do what they were, they were accusing them of. So make sure you know that there really was an offense. And I'm going to tell you, there are people that are just paranoid. I, I, I was dealing with one issue, and the person was like so set that someone had done something against them. And the person didn't even know who they were. Didn't even have a concept of who they were. They're like, who? Yeah, they said that you did this. I did what? I don't even know who they are. Think about that for a minute. Be sure it's not your own paranoia. Make sure there was really an offense. Okay? Step one. If, if your brother or sister has sinned against you, once you know that that's happened, what are you supposed to do? Well, it says you're supposed to go to them, right? You're supposed to go and rebuke them. We're going to talk about what the word rebuke means in a minute. But I want you to stick with me for a minute. He says you're supposed to go to them. You know what it doesn't say in here? It does not say you're supposed to go on Facebook and post all about it. You know what it does not say in here? It does not say you're supposed to pick up the phone and call eight of your friends and tell them how this person just ticked you off. You know what it does not say in here? It does not say that you get in a group of people while you're eating dinner and say, yeah, I just got to tell you one thing. So-and-so, man, they're just out of line. It says you are supposed to go talk to that person. And I'm going to say you again because you're also not supposed to be having other people deal with this issue. You are supposed to get up off of your rear end, go talk to that person face to face because you're the one who's been sinned against. You're the one who's been offended. You're the one who has the issue. And here's the thing. That person may not even know they've done anything yet. You're supposed to go talk to them. So when I, when I hear people going, do you know what this person said? I don't want to know. I've literally had people come to me and say, uh, Pastor, you need to know that so-and-so stopped right there. Have you talked to him yet? No, I haven't said anything to him yet. Then be quiet. Don't tell me a word because Scripture says you're not supposed to be coming and telling me what the issue is. You're supposed to be telling them what the issue is. Oh, but pastor, I want you involved. There's a process for that. Go to Matthew 18. You go first on your own. If the person doesn't repent, then you look for witnesses to go with you. But you haven't even done the first step yet. You want to jump to the next step because you want to have that process spread around. This is not to be spread around. This is to be kept private between you and the individual. You want to know why the process isn't working today? Because the process is now played out publicly as opposed to privately. So we go to that person. It says we're supposed to rebuke them. When I read this word rebuke, I'm thinking like, we're slapping somebody. When you read rebuke, I rebuke you. Bam. No, that's not what it means. The word actually means to admonish or make a charge. Let me express to you what that means is when you go to that person, the person's definitely sinned against you. They've definitely done something wrong. You go to talk to them face to face, nose to nose, the way God has told us to do it. You don't say it to anybody else, but when you're talking to them, this is what you say. Brother, this is the situation. This is what happened. And this is what you did. And it, and it, and it was wrong. And it hurt me in this way, or you sinned against me in this way. You know what you're not doing? You're not going, see how right I am? See how wrong you are? That's not what this is about. 
This is about bringing it to the attention of the situation. And if you know what the person is, you know what you're hoping the person is going to do? You're hoping the person's going to repent. You go into the conversation hoping they're just going to say, man, I'm so sorry that happened. You're not going into the conversation to be right. I'm going to say that again. You're not going into the conversation to be able to go, ooh, I got you. You're going into the conversation because there was an issue and you're scripturally following the process and the person you're hoping the person's going to repent so that then you can get this, forgive them. And the other thing you're not going into the process to be is to be a victim. There's too many people running around going, see what I've been wronged. I've been wronged. Yes, we've all been wronged and we've all wronged other people. So the reality is stop playing the victim and be what God has called you to be, a victorious person in Christ. You go talk to the person nose to nose. You tell them what the situation is. And you know what you're hoping your prayer is beforehand? Lord, I hope that they hear me. They hear my heart. I'm going to be earnest. I'm going to be exactly what I'm supposed to be. I'm not coming in there with any anger in my heart. I'm going to absolutely look for them to say that they're sorry and repent. And I'm going to forgive them. And you know what he says? We're supposed to forgive them over and over again. Anybody else not like that part of the verse? Some days you're like, man, it says I got to forgive them seven times in one day. I'm frustrated forgiving them one time in one day. Scripture says if they come to you seven times, they go, I'm messed up again. I, you got to forgive me. Fine. I'll forgive you again. I'll forgive you again. I'll forgive you again. I'll forgive you again. Remember when Peter asked Jesus, Jesus said, you forgive 70 times seven. It just goes on and on and on and on because the forgiveness of God is the same way with us. We forgive over and over and over and over again because he, that's what he does for us. I don't see Jesus coming to me after I ask forgiveness for that one issue that I still deal with on a regular basis. I don't hear him go, well, Pastor Aaron, that is 5,929 times that you've asked forgiveness for this issue. I'm sorry. You just passed your limit. Uh, we will not be able to forgive you anymore for that issue. No, he forgives, he loves, and he restores that relationship. And that's what we're supposed to do. Forgiveness is an important part of a disciple of Christ. And listen, here's the thing. What if they don't? What if they don't? We actually had someone in the first service raise their hand. I love it. That's only happened a few times in the years that we've been doing this. And uh, I just had somebody talk to me about it yesterday. Like, how do you react if somebody asks, asks a question in the middle of the sermon? I said, do you answer the question? I don't understand why that's confusing. So the person raised their hand and said, well, pastor, what if they refuse to repent? Well, the answer is simple. You follow the process. Then you go get the witnesses like it says in Matthew 18 and you continue on. But I'm also going to tell you something else. You go ahead and forgive them and move on. But pastor, they didn't repent. They're still wrong. I get that. But if you allow that to fester in your heart and grow, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get bitter. You're going to get angry. You're going to start looking for revenge. You're going to start doing a lot of stupid things that we don't want to get to and we don't want to be because that's not who we are anymore. We're forgiven by the grace and mercy of God. We need to learn how to forgive with that same grace and mercy and move forward in the love of Christ. That's true forgiveness. Let's look at number three. <clears throat> number three is a lesson on faith. Oh, I have a question at the back of the room. Yes, sir. No, I think you're right on. I think you're right on. When you don't forgive them, you are just allowing them to rent space in your heart and mind that they don't need to have. And the other problem is we as human beings, we're obsessed. You go, oh, pastor, why would you say that? Man, I'm going to tell you right now, people will, people will be obsessed over an issue for years. Stop. Let it go. Smile. Thank you, Jesus. I woke up this morning and God is good. And just move on. You know the best thing you can do when someone has wronged you and doesn't care? Show them forgiveness, love Christ, and move on. Because God is good no matter what. My circumstances do not dictate my joy. My God does. Okay? Nobody's going to change how much I am absolutely blessed and highly favored by God and totally happy with what God's doing in my life. Is it perfect? No, but it's better than it was without Jesus. And so I'm walking on a big high step every day knowing God is good. All right, let's look at, uh, let's look at number three. Thank you. I did not see that hand in the back until then. And that's a big long arm there too. I should have seen that one wrong way. All right. Number three, a lesson on faith. You know, I love this, that the apostles, 
That's the 12 that they said to Jesus, Jesus, increase my faith. But you know what? They have a misconception. They've got this idea that faith is like money or power or something. The more you have, the more effective it's going to be. So they're like, hey, give me some more of that. You know, hey, give me some more of that faith stuff. That seems pretty good. Give me some of that. I want you to understand faith from a little bit better perspective. I did this in the first service, and I did not fall down, so we're going to hope I don't fall down today in this second service. So if we're talking about faith, faith is really just putting your trust in something. And, and the way I define faith when I'm talking about God is it's directed belief with action. Because faith is really actually putting it into action, not just saying it. I can say, this chair is going to hold my weight. I can talk to you about it for a while. I can give you details. You know, this weight capacity on this chair is 400 pounds. The last time I weighed, I weighed 270 pounds. As fat as that is, that's still not over the weight limit on this chair. So that means I can still sit in this chair, and this chair will hold my weight. But I'm still standing here. So do I trust this chair? No. I don't really trust this chair and really put faith in this chair until I sit down. When my rear end finally touches this seat, and this seat does not fall, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I told them in the first service, I had, a, I had a, a brother, another pastor friend of mine, who used this illustration in a sermon, and the chair broke. <laughs> That's all right. I think his answer was, chairs can fail you, but Jesus will not. Anyway. <laughs> But I want you to think about, I want you to think about what, the, what, what the disciples are saying. They're saying, the, the, what the 12 are saying, is they're saying, give me more faith. I want to be able to believe and trust in you more, right? That's what they're saying. And Jesus is going, you know what? If you just took the little bit of faith you have and actually put it in action instead of just saying you have it, it would be effective. The size of a mustard seed is little. I used to have a little mustard seed and a pen that I used to wear on my vest. I've lost that over the years. A little tiny mustard seed. So it's one of the smallest seeds I've ever seen. And if you had that much faith, Jesus says, you could say to that mulberry tree, just go, throw yourself in the ocean, and it would do it. But you know what it is? It's actually taking your faith and putting it in action. It's belief directed at God and actually put to the test. You say, I believe that God can handle my situation. And so you find yourself resting in the peace and power of God instead of resting on your own ways and your own process. We put faith in so many things on a daily basis. We get up in the morning and we hope our bikes are going to start. We, we say, oh, it's going to start this morning. We get in the shower, we're, we're, we got faith that there's going to be hot water. We hope there's going to be money. We have faith there's going to be money in our account when we wake up in the morning. But here's the reality. When you face the real life situations that we all face, the struggles, the pains, the hurts, the trials, the tribulations, the disease. We say, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God like I trust this chair. But until we really relax in the comfort, power, and peace of our God and say, I trust you then have we really exercised the faith that we have? The answer is no. Try it. Try sitting in the comfort, power, and peace of your God this week. No, I trust you. I'm not going to try to fix it, God. I'm going to follow your direction. I'm going to follow your guidance, and I believe in you to the point where I can rest in you in that moment. That's what faith is. All right. I'm knocking stuff over. I'm just telling you. There's one point left, and I want to make sure we hit that. I know we're running out of time. But point four, point four is a lesson on humility and service. I love how Jesus just throws that right into the middle of the whole thing, right? He's already hit us with the stumbling block and the, the whole issue of forgiveness and then faith. And now he brings up humility and service. And he does it by telling a parable, by telling a story. And what he says is, that there's a servant who's out in the field, maybe taking care of the sheep or whatever, and he comes back home after working all day. And I love it. He goes, does the master say, hey, great job. You worked so hard. Come on in and have a seat and eat. No, it's not what he says because the servant's role is to continue to work. So the servant has to come in, has to clean up, has to make the food for God, make the food for the master who is represented by God. You continue to serve the Lord in that moment, right? You continue to do your servants, your servant's task, your servant's duty. And as I looked at this passage, I'm like, 
man, this passage seems like God's kind of mean. You know, you read this and you're like, man, I, God, God, I thought God was nicer to us than this. And actually, in Luke 12, 7, which we've already looked at, I won't look at it again today, but he talks about the fact that when the servant comes back who's done well, who's done what God has asked him, he does bring him in and invites him to sit down at the table. So he's not saying that we won't be a part of the feast and won't be a part of the table. He's saying in this setting, something is wrong with the actual servant's approach and his mindset. So what we have to unpack here and understand is, what is the servant doing that is inappropriate? Well, I think we get the clue in the fact that he says we need to just declare that we're an unworthy servant. You see, sometimes when people do the right things that they're supposed to be doing, they get a big head about it. Sometimes we as human beings begin to keep score. Well, I went to church this week. I threw some money in the, in the helmets in the back of the service. I did this, I did that, I served, I mowed the grass. Whatever it is, you, you did something to help out. So you're like, see what I did? You're keeping score. You're like trying to count your victories and count these rewards that you think you deserve because of how hard you work. And listen, there are rewards for what we do here on earth. But the biggest reward is the fact that we get to be a part of the family of God. And when our head is in the accomplishment of what we're doing and not just in faithfully serving the Lord, our motives are off. We have to remember that it really is all about him and not about us. The stuff that we do that is good is not because of anything we did, but it's because God did it through us. So as opposed to keeping score like, man, I'm doing great. Look what I'm doing for God. Honestly, what I have to say on a daily basis is I'm just an unworthy servant that because of the grace and mercy of God, I get to share in the righteousness of the Lord and I get to be about my father's business. I'm happy to serve. I'm happy to do whatever it takes, unclog a toilet, preach a sermon, wipe up a floor, shake a hand, hug a neck, go whatever. Because you know what? We get to serve the Lord. I'm so happy that God lets me hang out. I'll do whatever the task is. I don't care. I just want to be in his presence, doing his will and his way, because it's not about us. And what you see in this passage is that apparently some people were starting to think of themselves in an important way. But knowing who we really are matters. We really are just a broken individual who's been saved by grace. And having that mindset puts us where we need to be. All right. Whew. We made it through. But before we go into this time of invitation, just a couple things. One, I hope you hear me. At this time of year, you're going to have some opportunities to interact with other people, your family members, your co-workers, and a lot of other things. I think it's very, very important that we are not stumbling blocks to others during this time. We need to be shining a light of encouragement and God's love with everyone we meet and interact with. Second of all, people are going to hurt you and do things that are wrong. Handle it right. Handle it correctly. Handle it, more importantly, biblically. And handle it with grace and mercy, listen, that you want someone to handle it with you with later. Don't go beat somebody up because they did something wrong to you. Show them the love and the same grace and mercy that God sh showed you because guess what? Someone's going to come to you soon and you're going to want them to show you that same grace and mercy. So when we approach each other with grace and mercy and love, it changes the whole thing. And where's your faith right now in what you're going through? Are you really resting in God's plan, God's purpose, and God's power? Or are you still trying to fix everything yourself? And lastly, are you happy to serve God? You're not looking for kudos or rewards. You just want to faithfully serve God. Believers, that's where it's at. That's where it's important. Here's what we're going to do with heads bowed and with eyes closed. I do want to say this. If you're in this room today... As we bow our heads and close our eyes, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know that he loves you, that he cares for you, and that he died for you on a cross so that you could be a part of this family of God, to forgive you of your sins, to help you be a part of the family, and to ultimately have eternity with him. So if you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know you're not here by accident. And I hope that you'll take this moment and this time to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Ask him to forgive you and to come into your heart and give you a new life 
Because as we all know, when we try to live life without him, it's just not easy. It's difficult. And life, life is absolutely still difficult with Jesus, but now you're not alone. And he's there to get you through. If you'd like to invite him into your heart today, then just simply pray this prayer with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Everybody's doing that same thing. But in your heart, in your mind, just say this to Jesus. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I'm tired of doing things on my own. Forgive me. Be with me. And help me to be a child of God moving forward. Say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for coming into my heart this morning. Thank you, Jesus. With head still bowed and with eyes still closed, we're going to have a time of invitation. This is going to be an opportunity for you to come forward, and Butch is going to be up here with me. Um, and um, here, Butch, we'll trade sides today. And we will uh, we'll take this time just to pray with you and to encourage you. If you'd like us to pray with you about something specific, maybe it's around the sermon or otherwise. But as the music plays, this is your opportunity to come. Come on down. Well, on that note, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you guys as we finish up with the final song. Um, oh, wait, I'm, I forgot something. I'm getting so old. Angie, come on up here. Bella's coming too, right? Come on. We get to do this thing again. I love this. Come on out here. So uh, we are so glad to get to welcome... Uh, both Angie and Bella here to the church, and so we just want to go over what the uh, what the patch stands for, which we do every time, um, and then so we'll go through that. So the flag pennant on there, I only printed one, so I got to give this one to you when I'm done. Look at this, I'm saving paper. Uh, the flag pennant is Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and who, who he chose for his inheritance. That's for the flag across our, our logo. We know that America is still the greatest country on earth, and so we have, still have the red, white, and blue on everything that we do. The motor is uh, Romans 3, 23, that re represents us. Every motor, when it rolls off the assembly line, is doomed to fail, and so are we, because with the sin in our hearts. But God is the great mechanic, and as you see the cross here in the middle, it is 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
<coughs> but to those who are being saved, it is the very power of God. And the light coming out from behind the cross represents our new life in Christ out of 1 Corinthians 15, 21. I don't know why I'm coughing, sorry. <coughs> For since death came through one man, also the resurrection of the dead also came through one man. And the shield outlined in red for the blood of Christ is Romans 8, 37. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then our church verse out of John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you are free welcome to the family. <laughs> welcome, Bella. I'll hug you. God bless. Did you guys get some pictures? Oh, here. Let's get one good picture here. You guys send those to me, and I'll post them later. All right. On that note, pray this last prayer. You guys can stay up here for me to pray. Lord God, I just pray a blessing over everybody in this room. Surround them with angels. Protect them and lead them and guide them. I pray that you'd be with them as they walk and as they go through this week. And I pray that you'd help them to find your peace, your strength, and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Final song.